Good day, everyone. Our webinar for today is preparing forms for your NSF ATE proposal. I'm pleased to invite our host, Pam Silvers, to come on. Go ahead, Pam. Hello, and welcome, everyone. To let you know, if you put a question in the chat room, please put it to all panelists and everyone. That way, other people can see the questions and we can answer them. And you can change your view by clicking the view button in the upper right-hand corner. And if you do not want the full present presenter view or however you want to look at it, most of us have been using Zoom for a year now, so it probably is familiar to you. Welcome to preparing forms for your NSF ATE proposal. Our panelists today are Elaine Kraft, Alan Haas, and Emery DeWitt. And I'm now going to turn it over to Elaine to both start and tell a little bit about herself and the panelists. Thank you, Pam. Um, I'm the principal investigator for the Mentor Connect project, and I'd like to welcome all of you to our webinar today. Joining me are co-principal investigators, Ellen Haas from the American Association of Community Colleges in Washington, DC, and Emory DeWitt from Florence Darlington Technical College in South Carolina. Emory also serves as the project manager for Mentor Connect. Today's webinar is designed to help you correctly prepare the forms associated with submission of an NSF ATE grant proposal. While most of these forms are not unique to the NSF ATE program, some documents and instructions for completing the forms are specific to ATE. Our goal is to help you prepare a competitive grant proposal and avoid common mistakes as you prepare and submit your proposal. This is important. Errors in submitting the required information as specified can result in having your proposal returned without review. At a minimum, a lack of attention to detail can influence how reviewers consider your overall proposal. The Mentor Connect team will provide guidance for completing all required forms. Please be reminded, however, that we are not speaking on behalf of the National Science Foundation. Our opinions uh, are our own, and we will share information from NSF publications as well as from conversations with program officers and from our own experience. If you'll use the chat box, tell us how many people are in the room with you viewing this webinar. For this and other chat responses, I'd like to remind you to choose the option that sends your message to panelists and attendees. Group viewing isn't as common during the time of COVID-19, but some of you may be viewing this together. Our webinar system can only capture logins, so we appreciate your responses that will help us determine how many of you are actually in the audience today. First, I would like to give you an overview of what we will be discussing. We will cover forms and related documents that are required for all NSF ATE proposals. You can see from this diagram that the heart of any proposal is the project description. Some people refer to this as the narrative and we may use both terms during today's presentation. The project summary is essentially an elevator speech for your project. It is a short one page overview of the project. Ellen will share with you some information about these two project components later in the webinar but they really are not the emphasis of today's program. Also, there are two important proposal documents that we will not discuss at all today, budget forms and budget justification. These particularly critical components of a proposal were covered in a separate webinar that we provided earlier this year. The budget and budget justification webinar recording and a tutorial derived from that webinar are available on the Mentor Connect website. Emory will tell you more about how to access Mentor Connect resources a little later. So what are we discussing today? The cover sheet, project data form, biographical sketches, current and pending support forms, facilities equipment and other resources form, references cited, data management plan, list of collaborators, and supplemental documents, which are a little bit like appendices to a proposal. Each item serves a specific purpose. 
We will talk you through each one and help you understand what is required. Our desire is to help you better understand these forms and how to avoid some errors frequently seen by program officers and reviewers. The bottom line is that careful preparation of forms contributes to a proposal that is more competitive overall. I thought as an example might help you understand why forms are really not a trivial part of your grant proposal. The numbers in this example are from a typical project proposal that was submitted to the NSF ATE program several years ago. The full proposal was 86 pages long. Of those 86 pages, the project description or narrative filled 15 pages, which is the maximum. The project summary is restricted to one page. Budget forms for a three-year project will take up four pages, which is a budget for each year and a cumulative budget page for the entire proposal. The budget justification filled three pages in this particular example. So far, we have accounted for 23 pages of the proposal. Forms and supplementary documents make up the, the remaining 63 pages or 73% of this particular sample proposal. As you can see, the majority of the overall proposal is made up of forms and supplementary documents. This is no small amount of work. So get started on these forms right away. They take some time and need to be prepared thoughtfully. So we have another poll for you to see who all is in our audience. Those of you who are Mentor Connect participants include um, mentors, um, the faculty working on teams, administrators working with those teams, grant writers working with those teams, anybody who's working with our, our Mentor Connect cohort. Wow, we're delighted to have so many of our Mentor Connect participants in the audience today. We are also excited and extend a special welcome to those of you um, who are not in our current cohort. If you are not already working directly with Mentor Connect to learn about grant writing and how to increase the competitiveness of your grade to E uh, proposal, we encourage you to investigate this opportunity. Now I'm going to turn it over to Emory. Okay, thank you, Elaine. I will begin with two resources that you should refer to over and over again, the Advanced Technological Education Program Solicitation and the Proposal and Award Policies and Procedures Guide known by the acronym PAPPG. The newest version of the PAPPG is NSF 20-1 and was effective June 1st of 2020. While the PAPPG covers everything you need to know to submit a proposal and manage a project at any division at the End National Science Foundation, the AT solicitation includes information that is critical to ensuring that you meet all of the requirements that are specific to the ATE program. Read the solicitation, we'll say that over and over again. Uh, the current solicitation has expired following the October 1st, 2020 proposal submission date. We will all be eager to see what opportunities the next solicitation will, pro will provide, and that solicitation should be coming out pretty soon, so be out on the lookout. We recommend that you print out this solicitation and read it several times <laughs> and have it handy while you prepare your proposal. This advice applies to faculty who serve as principal investigators as well as grant writers. As you work to submit your proposal in the NSF online system called Fastlane, you will want to keep the Fastlane helpline number handy. Even before you think about starting on forms in Fastlane, meet as a team to discuss the following. Decide on one person to handle information input into Fastlane a principal investigator, an authorized organizational representative, or an AOR should cross-check and sign off, sign off for completeness before submission. 
Register your institution with Fastlane and get your flat Fastlane ID. Note that your Fastlane ID is the same ID you use to access research.gov. You will go back and forth between these two NSF systems while uploading and submitting your proposal. You may ask, who is your college's AOR? Well, to know, you'll need to know or decide who will fill this role early. It must be someone who is authorized to sp speak for and on behalf of the college in submitting the proposal. You can enter or upload information in Fastlane, delete it, and upload or redo with different information up until the proposal is finally submitted to NSF. So, since you have editing flexibility and there are so many forms to complete, you should get started with those forms sooner than later. I want to draw your attention to this light bulb icon that you'll see throughout the webinar. These are tips and tricks from the Mentor Connect team. These reminders will help you avoid errors and should make the process easier. Now back to the PAPPG, a document NSF publishes annually. Always make certain that you are referring to the most current version of the PAPPG. The PAPPG includes a proposal preparation section with information that is critical, such as allowable font sizes, margins, and other specific requirements for the proposal components. The PAPPG is available on the NSF.gov website. To locate the current PAPPG on the NSF.gov website, type 20-1 in the search box. You can sign up online to receive publications from NSF. Once you do, then you will be notified when important new NSF documents are published. So to begin your proposal, you must first log on to research.gov. The same login NSF number and password are used for Fastlane and research.gov. You'll choose F, which is the Fastlane proposal functions. Initiate a new proposal in the Fastlane template system. Fastlane is the online system that works most efficiently for submitting NSF proposals. In another year or so or sooner, uh, research.gov will replace Fastline as the primary online proposal and grantee communication system for all NSF grantees. Note that research.gov is an NSF website. Don't confuse this with grants.gov, which is not. There are many good reasons for using Fastlane instead of grants.gov when submitting grant proposals to the NSF. Data and information entered into the online system will look quite different in a hard copy. We will use screenshots to show you where to, where to input information and how forms look once completed. You will be click, clicking the go button to complete each form. We'll go through each of the forms individually. You will use all the go buttons in the first part of the Fastlane proposal preparation system. Please note there are two supplementary docs that apply to first time proposers. See the arrows. The, there is also one single copy document requirement. There are a few items that you will not need to worry about when completing forms. Go buttons for items such as the mentoring plan, the deviation authorization and suggested reviewers are not applicable to ATE proposals. Notice that you can view the latest updated saved information signified by date. NSF has implemented a new automated compliance check function. This will help ensure that proposal requirements are met prior to submission. Your proposal will not be accepted if required forms are not completed as specified. Let's talk about some tips for completing the cover sheet. The cover sheet provides NSF with a concise summary of all the administrative data about the proposal. Included is a requirement for college certification that all statements in the proposal are true and that the proposer will follow the appropriate federal grant regulations. A question and checkbox completed by the AOR for the college constitutes an electronic signature on behalf of the institution. There is no actual physical or electronic signature required. Note that the AOR must get all the way to the bottom of the cover sheet section and end of the page to reach this critically important authorization question. Only the AOR has the permission, 
granted by the college and set up in advance in Fastlane to check off on the certification authorization in the online system. There is no grace period for doing this. If this certification isn't complete when the proposal is submitted prior to the deadline, the proposal will be returned without review. At this time, the majority of AT proposals, including small grants for institutions new to ATE, will be submitted in the AT projects track. In the NSF unit consideration box, select DUE-ATE projects. This screenshot shows how you select the NSF Division of Undergraduate Education and Advanced Technological Education Program in identifying the funding opportunity for your proposal submission. Most often, the grantee organization or fiscal agent for the grant is the same as the performing organization, which is where the grant will be implemented. When this is not the case, you will need to specify the location of the fiscal agent as well as the location of the performing organization. So here are some cover sheet pointers. Also, new to ATE or any other ATE project should note as the funding mechanism as research other than rapid or eager. If in doubt, please call Mentor Connect, ask your mentor or call an NSF program officer. Getting your proposal in the right category for review is very important. Projects invariably take longer than you think they will. So it's a good idea to request the maximum time allowed for the type of grant you are requesting. Note that the duration of the grant you are requesting in months should be in whole year equivalents. So such as 24 months for two years, 36 months for three years. So under proposed duration, you will likely indicate 36 months for your three-year project. The amount requested is an important component in helping make sure your proposal is sent to the appropriate panel. For example, small grants are $300,000 or less. The total from your cumulative budget will be the number that appears on the cover sheet as the amount of funding being requested. Remember that indirect costs are required for each budget and must be included within the budget maximum for the type of proposal you are seeking. If you request more than $300,000, a proposal intended for the small grants for institutions new to ATE are likely to be placed in review panels with the larger, more competitive pool of ATE projects. This will reduce your chances of funding by as much as 40 to 50%. Your proposal number becomes your grant number if the proposal is funded. Knowing that proposal grant number is very helpful at every stage. This is how you locate your proposal when you work in Fastlane or research.gov. It is also how you identify your proposal when communicating with program officers. We collect these proposal numbers from participants in each Mentor Connect cohort to help us track the status of the proposal awards. NSF is most likely to set your start for the project on the date you have selected. Consider what will work with your business office and work plan. Most proposals have start days between June 1 and September 1. Consider the time it will take to get faculty release time worked out and when you want it to start. For example, if you receive your award notification in May and you selected a start date of September 1, you'll have all summer to get this worked out. Choosing a mid-semester start date will make it difficult or impossible to get people started working with grant support. Don't choose a date that is too early in the calendar year. This could result in receipt of your award notice on or after your requested start days, which puts you behind from day one. We don't want that. So don't expect to be able to change that start date once it's set by NSF in your award. On the screen, you will notice that there are several checked boxes. As you submit to the AT track, for example, here shows the appropriate selections. First time principal investigators should indicate this by selecting beginner investigator. You don't insert information directly into the cover sheet. You submit information elsewhere and Fastlane will populate all of that information to the cover sheet. The place to provide information for the cover sheet isn't always obvious. So be diligent about locating that data entry point. 
If this is not done carefully, you can end up with a PI or co-PI names on the cover sheet with no associated email addresses, phone numbers, or other information that is important to include. To a reviewer, that looks sloppy. Do this work diligently and always print pages to ensure that they look the way you intended before submission. So here's a print ready cover sheet sample. Keep in mind that the information page has been pulled from forms you've filled out elsewhere in the online system. To make corrections or edits, you will need to go back to the data entry point where that information was requested. This is what the cover sheet and certification page looks like when printed. As you can see, it's quite different than the information looked when inserted in various places in the Fastlane forms. So here are some tips and tricks for the cover sheet. It's important to remember that the cover sheet is where you will enter the title of your project. Don't use the NSF name or acronym in a project title and strive for something descriptive and meaningful. For example, teaching and learning innovations to improve success rates in manufacturing programs or bridge to nanotechnology. Don't be cute or demeaning and avoid awkward or misleading titles chosen specifically to create a clever acronym for your project. Missing contact information for the PI or co-PIs sends a message to reviewers that you haven't paid attention to details. The project data form. So this form provides the reader or reviewer a quick glimpse of the discipline, the type of college submitting the proposal, two or four year, potential numbers and kinds of population who will be impacted, and an indication of the kind of proposal in the broadest terms. Pay attention to the section on other institutions involved in the project. This can include organizations, businesses, or partner colleges and high schools. If your plan includes working with others outside of your college to achieve your objectives, this outreach and collaboration will be viewed positively by reviewers. Be thoughtful about the number of impacted people in different categories. Do not underreport your anticipated impact. Ask yourself this question. If a reviewer divides the amount of money being requested by the number of people you anticipate impacting, will this project look like a good investment? Give some thought to those numbers you report in this section and keep a record of your calculations in providing these numbers as reviewers or NSF program officers may ask for details prior to funding. Well, that was a lot of information and there's still more to come, but this is a freebie for you. It's Fastlane automates this portion of the proposal. Keep in mind that where you, your input data will look a bit different than this print ready page. So now I will turn it over to Pam uh, for questions. Pam. Thank you very much, Emery. We've had some really good questions in here. I think the first one, Elaine might be able to answer for it. And it's because we're expecting a new program solicitation and an updated PAPPG. Does that mean people should wait and not start working on their proposal until those are released? Oh, definitely not. Um, first of all, the changes um, from one publication to the next are not wholesale. In other words, it will not be an entirely different document, particularly that's true for the PAPPG. And at the beginning of each PAPPG, they will point out to you the changes that they've made, where they've clarified language and so forth. So that publication is, is very well established and typically is just tweaked with each new um, edition. So you, you wouldn't expect radical changes and you definitely should go by what's in the current one. Regarding the new ATE solicitation, um, while nothing is official yet, we do not expect uh, any significant changes to the small new to ATE program um, for those institutions new to ATE. Um, ATE projects, um, the guidelines for those, um, many of the things will stay the same. Um, new solicitations often offer new opportunities, a new funding opportunity, maybe a different amount of money for, to do something um, slightly different than what was offered before. Uh, but I think if you if you build your proposal based on the current solicitation and the current PAPPG, 
that whatever those changes are that we'll find out um, sometime in the next couple of months um, will not be so radical as it, it, that you would have to scrap it and start all over again. I think, I think you will be able to uh, adjust if there are any changes that require adjustment. Very good. And related to that also, do people have to wait to start uploading their documents until the new solicitation is out or could they start uploading the documents knowing they could edit them? You can upload them now um, and we encourage you to do that. It's better to have uh, all, you know, as much information in the system as you possibly can. You can replace component parts up until the time that proposal is submitted. And um, you know, sometimes life happens and uh, as we often hear, you don't want um, you, you don't want to be so hung up about everything being perfect that you end up not even putting in a good proposal. So right. if you um, so if you've got something in there, maybe it's not perfect when the time comes. It's better to get it in than it is to to not. So uh, we encourage you to put pieces in there and then continue to edit and and uh, re-upload until uh, until you. Um, need to submit the proposal. Okay, and this one's a related question, so I'll let you decide, Elaine, if you want to answer it or pass it to someone else, but is only the PI allowed to upload documents into the solicitation, or who can do it? Um, actually, the, uh, numerous people can upload components to a proposal. Um, it's good at your institution not to have, as we say, too many cooks stirring the pot, yeah, so it's good to come to, to a decision about who's really going to be doing this. Uh, it's good to have somebody uploading and then somebody checking and, and going back and making sure everything is done correctly. So uh, you need to work something out at your college, but it is possible for more than one person to do this. And if I can add in, at my college, it was my grant writer who uploaded it, and I did the review and made sure everything was okay. So it was a collaborative event with the two of us. Um, and one last question before we go on is that there was a little bit of confusion of the AOR or SRO. What if you don't know who it is? Is there any way to find out if your college ever designated one or how can you find out about it if you have no idea? Well, you should start if you have a grant writer, that's the place to start. Um, the grant writer, if uh, it is typically that person. If it is not that person, they will know who that person is. Um, if you do not have a grant writer, then you need to probably speak with your chief academic officer or someone like that at your college who would know who has been handling grant submissions for the college for other programs. Um, there probably isn't a community college out there that hasn't, uh, that doesn't have some Department of Ed funding. Um, of some sort. And so you, your college has done some grant things with the federal government. Um, and so just find out who it is that's been handling that and, and talk with them about who should be doing this for the college for your uh, And NSF. as a follow-up, if you cannot find out internally, would NSF be able to tell you if you have one designated or how, if you do and you don't realize it, what happens? I'm not sure. Um, it, it often you, that that particular um, authorized organizational representative or sometimes referred to as a sponsored research officer on um, SRO at the college, um, if they haven't, if somebody hasn't been doing that function, then you couldn't get into Fastlane or uh, research.gov anyway. So um, I, you could probably call the help desk and ask. Um, about that, I'm, I'm really not sure if you don't know, but you think your system, you know, your college is in the system. Sometimes you have personnel changes and that's um, kind of brings up a different topic about making sure that multiple people at the college have this information. Because when you have personnel changes um, and you, nobody has passwords and uh, you can get locked out of that system and it's a real hassle to get reestablished. And Heather has added in the chat box that research.gov does tell you who your AOR is when you try to affiliate with your institution. Okay, great. Good. So that is really good to know because if it's been a long time and people have left your college, you might not have the internal knowledge. So those are great questions coming in. And I think that it's we need to continue on, but keep asking your questions in the chat box 
and we will answer questions later. And now Ellen is going to continue with the project summary. Thank you, Pam. Uh, yes, so your project summary. So this is essentially your one pager. It's a summary of the project that includes an overview and most importantly, uh, a statement on the intellectual merit and a statement on the broader impacts of your proposed activities. So your proposal will not be accepted if it is submitted without a project summary or if the project summary does not address both the intellectual merit and broader impacts of your proposal. So if we can move forward. You'll see here on the screen three text boxes. So Fastlane will prompt you to enter this information into these text boxes. Again, your project summary in total should be no more than one page. And the total number of characters that will be accepted totaling all three text boxes is 4,600 characters. So if you prepare your project summary in Word, you can then cut and paste the appropriate pieces into the text boxes. But we do ask you to proofread that. There can sometimes be difficulty with with character counts when cutting and pasting. So if you get repeated errors, you may have to resort to typing the text directly into the text boxes. Uh, and if you do successfully cut and paste, again, proofread, possessive sometimes as an example can translate into different types of characters. So you'll need to work within the text boxes. NSF will only accept the project summary as an, up, as an uploaded separate document if it contains special characters, such as mathematical symbols or Greek letters, in which case you'd have to check a box on the sheet that you were uploading it as a, a supplemental document. Um, but it's really not typical for ATE project summaries to have special characters. So do be prepared to work within these text boxes for submitting your project summary. And in moving forward, just talking a little bit more about some key takeaways. Uh, for your overview, you'll want to include a description of the activity that would result if the proposal were funded and a statement of the objectives or methods to be used. So it should really clearly indicate in the first few sentences the disciplinary focus of the project, the kinds of activities proposed, and the primary audience for these activities. So you're going to need to get right to the point of your grant and explain your proposal's objectives and what you would do to achieve those objectives. And as a general rule, you don't want to use this space for building a rationale for your project or describing your, your college or its community. Uh, this is really should be a concise overview. As it says on the slide, consider it your elevator speech. If this is all someone reads about your project, they should be able to understand what you're trying to do and your desired outcomes. And when addressing intellectual merit and broader impacts, please be sure to understand what NSF means by those terms. There's criteria provided in the request for proposals and the PAPPG. Uh, you do not have to address all the criteria listed by NSF in the ATE program, but you should plan to align with at least some of what has been provided to prospective grantees. So the statement on intellectual merit should describe the potential of the proposed activities to advance knowledge. The statement on broader impact should describe the potential of the activity to benefit society. Um, so some examples taken from the RFP, does the project have the potential for improving student learning in science or engineering technician education programs? Are the goals, objectives, and outcomes and the plans and procedures for achieving them worthwhile, well-developed, and realistic? Some examples under broader impacts. Has an assessment of workforce needs for technicians been conducted? Does the project work with employers to address their current and future needs? Um, will the project's results be widely disseminated? So again, be sure to pay close attention to these when crafting your intellectual merit and broader impact statements. So if we move now to our project description. So your project description is actually the heart of your proposal. Uh, as Elaine indicated at the top of this uh, presentation, it should provide a clear statement of the work and the activities that you are undertaking. Uh, it should address what you want to do, why, how you plan to do it, how you'll know if you're successful and what the benefits and impacts will be resulting from a successful project. So that means including information on the project's motivating rationale, goals and objectives, deliverables and activities, as well as incorporating a timeline, um, a management plan, covering the roles and responsibilities of PIs and co-PIs and senior personnel, a plan for sustainability, um, an evaluation plan and a dissemination plan all in 15 pages. Okay, no problem. You've got this. Um, pay close attention to addressing, again, intellectual merit and broader impacts. And also note that your project description must include a separate section within the narrative uh, labeled broader impacts where you can address the broader impacts of your proposed work. 
you must include a subsection labeled evaluation plan um, in that you would include detailed information on aspects of the project to be evaluated that addresses both project implementation and outcomes, data sources and collection methods, and how that data will be used, and plans to incorporate evaluation results to improve the project. And it's also recommended that your project eval evaluator, if you can do so, be named in the project description. And for more information on uh, checklists and resources for developing ATE evaluation plans for your proposals, please see specific resources in the Mentor Connect resource library uh, and also evaluate. So on the screen here, this is the actual form um, in Fastlane for the project description, because you would upload your project description as a PDF or in a variety of um, word processor files and Fastlane will convert it to a PDF. You do want to double check upon upload that, um, make sure that there are no conversion issues. And just for some takeaways on project descriptions, um, these may seem like no brainers, but they're actually you know, really important to the success of your proposal. You do want to pay attention to font size and layout and the size of your document. Um, the length of the project description must fit into 15 pages with one inch margins on all sides. So once uploaded, it's a good idea again to check that you don't exceed this amount. Um, while the PAPPG allows for a minimum font of 10 point in specific font sizes such as Arial or Courier, um, Mentor Connect recommends that you use an 11 or 12 point standard font to ensure readability. You'll want to consider using section headings, bullets, or charts to ensure a clear proposal and readability. And keep in mind that reviewers may be reading up to 12 proposals. You may be the last one they're reading late at night. So proposals that have been submitted using a minimum font size or have a poor layout or don't clearly address the topics of the solicitation, uh, they obviously will not encourage a, a good rating. So, th so things to think about. Um, as another point on formatting, do not use automated endnotes. You can number your references and then you would list them in a separate reference section. Uh, there's a reference cited section in Fastlane. That's where you would upload your references or put, put them into a text box. And references cited is a required section. Uh, and the project description should make clear how each reference played a role in motivating the project's design. So that references cited section, which I'll cover shortly, does not count towards your 15 page limit. Another note on the project description is that it should be self-contained and not include URLs that would ask reviewers to leave the description to view an external site. Uh, reviewers are under no obligation to view those sites. Those sites could actually circumvent your page limitations or be altered or gone by the time you submit. And um, you do want to start your project description with the required section, which is results from prior NSF support. If applicable, as the majority of you are applying for the NSF funding new to ATE, you would not necessarily have um, NSF funding, but if any PI or co-PI identified on the project has received NSF funding or funding from other sources um, that those rewards pertain to the scope of work that you're seeking to undertake, you need to provide information on this in the results of prior support section. And this subsection would include specific outcomes and results, including metrics to demonstrate to demonstrate the impact of prior project activities. And if you have no prior support, you would just need to list that you have no prior support to share. But it's a good opportunity to mention that while you have no prior results to share, you were a part of the Mentor Connect cohort. And then if we can move to biosketches, I saw that there were some questions already in chat on biosketches, so hopefully I address them here. Um, they are required for each individual on a proposal identified as senior personnel, including the PIs and co-PIs. And there are two ways to submit a biosketch to NSF. One is through uploading the biosketch through a site in partnership with the National Institutes of Health, which really serves more the needs of the research community. And the second option uh, for submission and the one we're recommending um, for Mentor Connect is to use the new fillable PDF form provided on NSF's website. So that can be completed and uploaded into Fastlane. And if we move forward, NSF has a very specific format for the bio sketches. Again, this is outlined in the PAPPG. They must be limited to two pages and should be uploaded as a single PDF in the NSF approved fillable PDF template for each individual listed as senior personnel on the proposal. Um, there's, this is also something you can start to work on now, as we said that you can start to park these documents in Fastlane now while you continue to work on other parts of your proposal. And you can certainly designate one person to check and upload all the bio sketches for consistency. 
So biosketches must include the following components that address education and experience to run the grant project. You do not want to include any personal contact information, but you do want to list professional preparation, the name of undergraduate, graduate, or postdoctoral institutions if applicable, and include the location of the institution, majors, degrees, and year. You will want to provide appointments listed in reverse chronological order of all the individual's academic or professional appointments beginning with current employment, including the time frame, position, title, organization, and location. For products, there are two sections for products or publications. It's a place to input a list of up to five products most closely related to the proposed project and a list of up to five other significant um, products, whether or not related to it. Uh, so the acceptable products uh, must be citable and accessible. Um, including but not limited to publications, data sets, software, patents, and copyrights. Uh, unacceptable products are unpublished documents not yet submitted for publication, invited lectures, and only a list of 10 will be used um, for the review of the proposal. And the list must include full citation information. And even if you do not have products or publications, that is certainly okay. Again, this biosketch format has also been created to serve the needs of the research community applying for NSF funding. So it's okay if you don't have anything to list in this section. Um, a section you do want to take a look at is, a, is synergistic activities, where you would provide a list up to five examples that demonstrate the broader impact of the individual's professional and or academic activities as it relates to the proposed activities of your of your what you're hoping to have for uh, achieve for grant funding. So this is the place to list the individual skills and assets. So some examples of things to include in this category uh, might be innovations in teaching and, and, and training, development of curricular materials and pedagogical methods, broadening the participation of groups underrepresented in STEM, service to the scientific or engineering community outside of the individual's immediate organization. Um, some activities would be if you've worked um, as a subrecipient um, with an ATE center, or if you're working as a partner with other ATE products, projects, or if you have an individual membership in a professional society, such as the Council on Undergraduate Research or the American Mathematical Association of two-year colleges, if it relates to your proposed grant activities. And I think that's what we have on bio sketches. We've covered a lot of information. So I'm going to turn it over now to Elaine to talk about current and pending support. Thank you, Ellen. Current pending support forms are required and a new form requirements are in effect. There are only two acceptable templates for submitting this information. We recommend that you use the fillable PDF provided by NSF. The other option is Ellen indicated for the new BioSketch um, forms um, information is really designed more for the research community. The other option um, that is mostly for the research community is provided by the National Institutes of Health and must be completed in a completely different system. The PAPPG 20-1 provides additional information about these two options. So why have this form? NSF wants the people in senior personnel roles working on grants to have dedicated time to do this work. Current pending support forms show NSF how much of your time is committed or will be committed to funded projects or other commitments. This helps program officers determine the capacity of an individual to take on the proposed scope of work if the project is funded. This reporting must include projects supported by all funding sources and not just NSF. <clears throat> Excuse me. The expectation is that any person working on a grant will either be paid directly by the grant or that the person will be released from a portion of his or her teaching or other workload to do the grant work. When release time is used, grant funds may be used to pay replacement faculty or other personnel. A combination of these payment methods is possible. For example, a faculty member may receive release time during the academic year, but be paid directly to work on the grant in the summer when he or she may not normally be under contract to the college. Anyone serving in a PI, principal investigator, co-PI, or senior personnel role must have current and pending support forms included with the proposal. 
This includes anyone working on the grant in one of these roles who is paid by your college from grant funds, even if the person is not an employee of the college. How the person is paid as an employee or as a consultant is not important. The person's leadership role in the grant triggers the requirement for current and pending support forms. It is important to know that NSF means uh, by the terms current and pending. Current refers to grants that have already been awarded, not the one you're currently preparing. A pending proposal is one that either has not yet been submitted, like the one you're working on now, or a proposal that has been submitted, but for which the funding decision is not yet known. The proposal you have in progress now for October submission is considered pending support. Now let's talk about how many of these current and pending support forms you will need to prepare. For each person, there must be a current and pending support form for each proposed or ongoing project for which the person has a time commitment, including the proposal you're preparing. This means that every person included in your proposal in a PI, co-PI, or other senior per personnel role will have at least one current and pending support form, even if this is your first NSF ATE proposal. The Proposal and Award Policies and Procedure Guide, the PAPPG, tells us that current and pending support forms must include all current project support from whatever source. The PAPPG cites as examples, federal, state, local, or foreign government agencies, public or private foundations, industrial or other commercial organizations. Please note that the PAPPG also states that the proposed project and all other projects or activities requiring a portion of the time of the PI or other senior personnel must be included, even if the person will receive no salary support from the projects it's still eating up a portion of their time, so they wanna know about it. The current and pending support form provides for non-compensated commitments to be reported as in-kind contributions. If this is your first grant, you may only need to submit one current and pending support form for each person serving in a prin as principal investigator or other senior personnel role. However, be careful to check to make sure that these individuals are not working on other funded projects, such as a Department of Labor grant, state funded grants, or foundation funded grants that will need to be reported. As mentioned, we recommend that you use a fillable PDF form that NSF provides for preparing current and pending support forms. The instructions for this form are depicted on the screen. Note that the form provides for project proposal entries marked with a green arrow and in-kind contribution er entries marked with a red arrow. Beware of in-kind entries. Um, if you report uncompensated time commitments using this portion of the form, do not include any dollar amount, although there is a space provided for this information. This form is also used by NSF programs for which cost sharing is required or allowed. Cost sharing is expressly prohibited in the ATE program. This screen shows the actual template that you will complete for each person and each project. Several changes have been made from the previous version. For example, proposal start and end dates require only month and year. Additional categories of proposal status are provided as options, but are not likely applicable to ATE projects. One significant change is that time commitments um, are now to be reported for each year of the project and person months may be reported to two decimal places. Some of you will notice that a previous requirement to specify time by calendar months, academic months or summer months has been eliminated on this particular form. The time reporting requirement in the new form is a person's total time commitment in a calendar year. Now let's talk about information you will need to supply on the current and pending support forms. Here is the information that you will need for each current and pending support form that you complete. You'll need the project or proposal title, that's pretty 
self-explanatory, the support type, and that's where it's either current or pending, the award number if known, and of course that would apply to, to awards already um, made, um, so that would be a current support. The source of support, this is asking who is currently funding or who is being asked to fund the project. Typical sources include the NSF, Department of Labor, U.S. Department of Education, a state such as California, or a foundation such as the Lumina Foundation. The project location is your institution's location or the location of another organization if someone on your team is working on a funded project not based at your college. The start date will be the actual start date for funded projects or the requested start date of a project that you have pinned. The ending date should be assigned or in, uh, the assigned or anticipated end of the project. The total award amount, um, including indirect cost, will be the budget that was awarded for a funded project or that is being requested for the projects that you have or project that you have pending. Person months per year committed to the project is where NSF requires that individual time commitments be reported in person months. It is easy to make mistakes in calculating a person's time commitment to report it this way. So I'm gonna provide some examples to help you with this. Person months represents the cumulative time a person will spend on the project over a year. It does not consider the spread of that work over time. In the first example, we have a 12-month employee who dedicates 10% of his or her time to grant work. The number you should put in the current and pending support form is 1.2 person months, which is 10% of 12 months. Next, consider a faculty member who is working on an academic contract. Typically, these contracts are for nine months, but may vary by institution. This is where your math skills will be needed because all time must be listed in person months. Some translation will be required. For example, if a faculty member typically teaches five courses per semester, and this person will be provided with one course release time to work on the grant fall and spring semesters, that is considered one fifth of the person's workload or 20% release time. Calculate 20% of the months covered by the academic year contract. In this example, I assumed a nine month contract, a full-time teaching load of five classes and one course release time per semester to be provided by the grant. This will be 1.8 person months for the year. If the release time for this person is just for one semester, then you would report half as much time in months or 0 0.90 person months for the year. <clears throat> now, let's consider a situation where the teacher who had one course release time for fall and spring semesters will also work on the grant in the summer. For example, the summertime commitment could be two weeks or a half a month, which would be reported as 0 0.50 person months. In this case, the faculty member has the release time we calculated on the previous slide in the fall and spring but the faculty member will also work one half month in the summer in years one and two of the project. Note that this time isn't budgeted for the summer of year three. This enables me to show you how different times can be reported for different years of the project. You will notice that adding one half month makes the faculty member's total time commitment 2.30 person months in years one and two and 1.8 person months in year three. I noted with the red arrow the year in which this person's total time is different. You will be able to provide specifics about how the faculty member's time will be divided over the year in the proposal and or in the budget justification. The URL to access the new current and pending support form is provided on this slide. Uh, I think Pam may also put that in the chat box for you. Also, the web link to NS, uh, access the NSF PowerPoint presentation about all changes in the PA PPG 20-1 is provided. I realize that these web link addresses are long. 
If you are unable to capture this information from the screen today, you will be able to access this information from the tutorial that will be provided from today's webinar. It is important to note that although the PAPPG mentions limiting faculty time to two summer months, this limitation does not apply to ATE grants as long as the time requested is considered reasonable for the scope of work described. Even so, if you plan to request more than two months faculty time in your proposal, you may want to contact an ATE program officer prior to finalizing your budget. It's important here for me to also point out, and I think um, my colleague Karen Wazina Birch put a note in the chat box about this, that when the solicitation instructions differ from the PAPPG, it is the solicitation that is the controlling document. So in this case, since ATE allows faculty to work more than two months, whereas the PAPPG indicates uh, a two month limit, it is that solicitation that is controlling and therefore it is permissible. It still has to be justified, but it is permissible. Always keep in mind that personnel time on grants need to be reasonable and aligned with the work that the person will be doing. Reviewers expect to see key personnel included in the budget with compensation for the time they will devote to the grant. Beware of having personnel donate time to grant funded projects. Reviewers will be very skeptical and may doubt that the scope of work will actually be completed. If the proposal does not include grant supported personnel with specific responsibilities for completing the scope of work. Reviewers will be looking for faculty time and a corresponding budget request to support that time. Also beware that donated time may be considered voluntary committed cost sharing, which is prohibited. So now I'm gonna turn it back over to Ellen who will talk about several other important forms. Thank you, Elaine. So I'll be talking about facilities, equipment, and other resources. So this form is used to describe any internal and external resources that the organization and its collaborators will provide to your project should it be funded. So it's really designed to assess the adequacy of the organizational resources available to perform the proposed project. It provides an opportunity to explain the infrastructure, laboratories, equipment at your institution, and perhaps at a partner location that will be available for use to support the success of your project. So keep in mind that you shouldn't use this space to describe all the capabilities of your college, only those relevant to the project to help NSF assess the resources that are available. And the information provided on this form should be narrative in nature and not include any quantifiable financial information. So the form offers the following categories for submitting information, uh, laboratory, clinical, animal, computer, office, other, and major equipment. For ATE grants, the clinical and animal categories are typically not applicable. And you may, you may just indicate this on the form. It has been done on the example on the screen. So for laboratory support, this is often quite important for the successful imp implementation of an ATE grant. And if this is the case for your project, you'll want to describe any current capability, even if the proposal includes some improvements or some equipment additions. For computer capability, this also can be essential for your grant, especially if the project focuses on IT, cybersecurity, and any number of other advanced technologies that are computer dependent, and will make use of the computing capability in computer labs at your institution. So you'll want to list that there. For office support, this is also important to describe some budget guidelines specifically stating that the grant budgets um, may not include office furnishings or everyday office equipment such as computers, copiers, and items that support normal office operations. So the personnel implementing the grant, however, will need office support to do so. So if your institution is providing dedicated office space, access to administrative support um, or items um, you know, that cannot be funded by the grant, but support you in your grant initiatives in terms of office support. This is a good place to make a statement about that. In the other section, this is where you can describe resources other than facilities and equipment, such as personnel. So for example, this is a place where you could describe the talent you've assembled to serve on an internal advisory committee, or perhaps you have a college recruiter lined up who will support the outreach, outreach activities of the grant, but who will not receive compensation from the grant for doing so. 
A third example of personnel you may want to describe in this section could be institutional research personnel who will help with internal evaluation or data collection. So in, in other words, if someone will be working to support the project without compensation, this is the place to describe the donated time, uh, but don't assign monetary value to this time or state it as a specific time commitment. Under major equipment, again, this is, can be a very important category for some ATE grants. Advanced technology programs are often very equipment dependent and intensive. So your institution may have major equipment that will be used in implementing your grant, or you may have a partner, uh, whether a university or industry working with the project and providing major equipment for your students. Uh, or perhaps you have someone, a partner that is teaching your students. So if major equipment like this is involved in the success of your project, this is the place where you can describe the availability of those resources being provided by an industry or an education partner. References cited. So we mentioned this when we were talking about the project description. If you cite materials in your project narrative, you will list your source material in a separate references section and not in the project description itself. So NSF expects you to do some research in the process of developing a grant proposal. Like most funding sources, they encourage the use of research-based strategies and adaptation and implementation from previously funded NSF ATE or other funded projects. Your references indicate that you should have investigated what other, others have done that have worked, and you'll want to cite references that explain outcomes that led you to a particular strategy or teaching methodology or other promising or proven approach uh, that is addressing the challenges that you're, you're attempting to uh, take on in your um, proposal on technician education. So your reference citations are also used to cite the sources of the data that you provided in describing your project rationale or your results of prior support. And as you include information from your research, you'll want to manually number your references again throughout your project description, and then prepare a separate document with citations that correspond to those numbers. And that document would be uploaded here. So again, references are a separate section of the proposal and do not count towards your 15 page project description. Um, we're often asked, uh, is there a, sp a specific style that NSF prefers? They're just looking for standard academic scholarly um, practice and citation. So you can choose um, which of those you would want to follow. In terms of data management plans, which is coming up on the next slide. Including a data management plan is a requirement for ATE proposals. So you'll need to prepare a supplementary document of no more than two pages labeled data management plan. And this document should describe how the proposal will conform to NSF policy on the dissemination and sharing of your project's results. So in essence, NSF expects you to share the outcomes of, of your work. So PIs are expected to share primary data, samples, and supporting materials from their grant projects. And your plan will be reviewed as part of the intellectual merit and or broader impacts of your proposal. So your data management plan should specify the types of data and other materials and products that will be generated or collected by the project, how that data will be stored, protected, and appropriately shared, how what is generated by the project will be preserved during and beyond the project, and how others will be able to access uh, these project products. So on the next slide, we have a sample data management plan. It was prepared for a small grant for institutions new to ATE proposal. And Mentor Connect has sample proposals in our online resource collection uh, to see data management plans. You're welcome to look at those. Um, and there is a URL on the screen that I believe Pam is also going to put into chat because NSF provides a detailed uh, frequently asked questions on data management plans uh, that you can consult as well. Moving on to other supplemental materials. So do note this section is not considered an appendix. They are required supplemental documents. You need to include a data management plan, which I just discussed. You also need to put together a list of all known people aside from participants and students who will receive compensation from the project and their affiliation. And this would need to be uploaded under other supplementary documents documents into Fastly. Um, so you'll need to provide the list of people receiving compensation. This is again an area to really look for consistency. It needs to be consistent with your budget and your budget justification and with your current um, and parent pending support forms. So in other words, you don't want somebody listed in this supplemental document whose function hasn't already been addressed in the project description and the budget. 
letters of collaboration. So this is Karen indicated this in, ch in chat and um, Elaine referenced it. This is an example of where the ATE program solicitation um, kind of trumps the PAPPG because letters of collaboration are required to submit an ATE grant. The key word here is collaboration. So reviewers want to see documentation of the commitment described in the proposal, such as a letter from an industry partner uh, pledging resources or time to the project. Letters should outline specific collaborations and not just endorse or offer non-specific -spe support. Um, so if you do, your proposal could be returned without review. If we just have letters that say, I support this proposal, it's a good idea. Um, it really needs to include examples of substantive collaboration or commitment uh, to the project in these letters. And the ATE proposal solicitation also asks that you include a bio sketch of an external evaluator as a supplemental document if that person is named in the project description. If we move forward, we also have a single copy document, collaborators and other affiliations. So NSF requires that you use an NSF template available on their website. Again, there's a URL on the slide um, to list any collaborators and affiliations for any senior personnel on the project. So the template includes listing the name and affiliation of the individual as of the last 12 months and collaborators on projects such as funded grants, research articles, uh, paper collaborators in the last 48 months. So the template has been developed to be fillable. However, the content and format requirements must uh, not be altered by the user. That will cause errors and impact how it's viewed upon submission. Uh, this template must be saved in an Excel format and directly uploaded into Fastlane. And there's a place to upload that uh, as under collaborators and other affiliations single copy document. Again, the URL has detailed instructions on that and where you can find the fillable F, um, PDF. And this is primarily used by NSF as they determine um, review panels for the proposals. And some general advice. I'm trying to get through quickly. My apologies, because I know there's so many questions that we want to get to. Uh, so again, you're going to want to start early and review what you've written several times. You don't want to get into a time crunch the night before proposal submission. Uh, take the time to plan out your proposal, write and review it, and have others review it as well. And don't be afraid to ask questions of your mentors, uh, of the Mentor Connect team. We're all here for you and happy to help. And chances are, if, if, if you're asking it, somebody has asked it before you. Um, so we're, we're here to help and want to address any questions that you, that you have. And with that, I think we are turning to a question break at this time. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, there's so many questions. I think I'm going to start with one for you is, how many references should you have? Maybe you just know you have a great idea and you don't have any references. Is it okay to put none? You absolutely should have some references. I don't think that there's a requirement in terms of how many references, but NSF is looking that you have done some research on your project that you are substantiating the rationale and, and including some citations. So you definitely do want to uh, be including references with your proposal that even if this is a good idea, you want to be researching what has gone before you, what you can build on, or any um, research that can support your case uh, for seeking these funds. Okay, and another question for you is in the bio sketch, is the professional development only academic degrees or would you include certifications or other items such as that? Well, in the PAPBG, it just says academic degrees, but I would think in the case, I have certainly seen bio sketches that include that information and maybe Elaine could elaborate, but I would think if you have a certification or something that directly relates to the scope of work you're undertaking uh, for this, this grant that you would list it there under professional preparation. Okay. And Elaine, I don't know if you have anything to add there because I do also have a question for you. Okay, I pushed the wrong button and I disappeared, <laughs> but I'm back. Okay, um, yes, definitely um, for ATE proposals, the credentials of the people that are implementing this project are extremely important. And for ATE, um, industry certifications are very important. Licensure is very important. Um, if you're a registered professional engineer, those qualifications and, and the experience that it reflects are extremely important. 
It may be with the new biosketch form a little awkward to put those things in that form. Uh, and if you're struggling with that and figuring out how to do it, at least be sure that you put it in your project description. You will need to talk about who is going to be running your project and working on your project. And so uh, you don't want to put your whole bio sketch in the project description, but where there's some particularly relevant experience, certifications, licensure, and so forth, that really fits with your project, you want the reviewers to know this. This is part of the intellectual merit of your project. Okay, and Elaine, this one is for you. In the example of how many months we're going to be de devoted to the project, you used a year like 2021. Is that a calendar year or is that the start year for year one of your project or um, how do it you will, do it the will years? Be, it will be your, your grant year. It will be your grant year. So when you're, you know, if your grant starts September the 1st, you're talking about the time commitment from September 1st to August 31st. If it starts June 1st, then it's June 1 to May 31. Okay. So if you're talking grant years when you're talking to NSF. Okay. And so the year you would put in there is the start year of year one, where you had and 2021. You bring up a good point that we don't talk about often, but I'll throw it out here since we're on the topic. Uh, when you're doing your proposal, sometimes you can spend a lot of time really um, struggling with putting timelines and when things are going to start, and you're not really sure when you're going to get your award and when you can start. So very often what you want to do is just call it quarter one of year one of your grant or quarter two of year one. So, so tie it to the grant year and then you can break it down. Maybe it's month one of year two of your grant. Uh, but I would do that more generic type timing as opposed to try to say this is going to happen in September and this is going to happen in February, uh, because those dates can be pretty, um, pretty hard to nail down in advance. And I'm not sure if this is a good question to ask, but it's come up in a couple of different ways. Which forms or which required documents are forms that you use? The bio sketch is a form and the facilities and equipment. Um, and which ones are just freehand writing in Word? Um, the facilities uh, is, is a pre-done pre form that you fill in. The BioSketch is now a pre-done form that you fill in. Uh, previously, you could, you could free draft those. Um, more and more, they're going to the fillable template types of forms. Um, there are a few things that you still have to write um, and oddly, your, um, your project summary is one of those. It goes, you know, it's text that you put in a text box. Um, but, and I don't know whether that's going to remain true in research.gov that we're shifting to. Um, you can use Fastlane for your October uh, 2021 submissions in October 2022. We're all switching to research.gov. Um, and uh, we haven't used it yet, so I don't have all the answers to that system. Um, some of you may choose to go ahead and, and work in research.gov this year. If you do, I hope you will share with us what that experience is like. We think it's going to be an improvement, but uh, until we do it, we can't say for sure. Okay, and we are going to continue with Emory giving some really important information. At the end, we're going to have an evaluation, which first of all, please stay on and do the evaluation because if you ever receive NSF funding, you know that it doesn't count just to have an event. You have to know what happened with it. So during the evaluation, we will also answer some questions if you have it. So please put it in there and Emery, if you wanna continue. Thank you, Pam. I appreciate you. I was just gonna say we value your feedback. So stay with us for a few more minutes um, for the evaluation. I'm just gonna talk about our, uh, the Mentor Connect project offers a resource library that is specifically provides solutions to your grant proposal writing needs for the ATE program. One of our great resources is our coffee break and Pam Silvers has been um, one that has been developing those. And, um, Coffee breaks provide a quick answer to frequently asked questions that arise while you're working on and preparing to submit your NSFAT proposal. A few of the coffee breaks that relate to the forms are facilities and equipment, bio sketches, data management plan, and citations and references. So the coffee break advice is available 
in the Mentor Connect library, um, which is on the screen, you would go to the um, mentorconnect.org, um, find a resource, select webinars, and then type in coffee break in the search function at the top of the page. Other AT resources that are helpful in proposal preparation include resources to guide project evaluation at the evaluate.org website and links to the AT projects and centers, uh, curriculum and other resources at the atcentral.net website. We would really want you to connect with us. Um, we have a number of ways in which you can stay in touch with us. Send us an email, visit us on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn and check out our YouTube channel. We welcome any questions or follow-up that you may have. Most importantly, we encourage you to visit our website, call or email our help desk for answers to any of your questions. Uh, this webinar and the PowerPoint slides will be available following the broadcast in our archive for later viewing. In addition, Mentor Connect provides a wonderful tutorial on the forms uh, based on today's content in the PowerPoint slides that kind of enables you to review one or multiple forms and instructions that have been provided. So now I'm going to send it back to Mike uh, for our evaluation. And once again, we value your feedback. Just take a moment to complete our short evaluation survey. Uh, Mike, can you launch that survey for us? Thank you. Now, Pam, do you want to see if there's some other questions while they are kind of answering that? If you, um... yeah, so please do um, answer the question, the poll. You do have to scroll down um, mm -hmm. to answer them all and hit the submit button, and we do appreciate it. It, like I said, as far as NSF is concerned, you weren't here if you didn't do the, don't do the evaluation. And I know that's not totally true, but I'm going to go with it. There's been some great comments in the chat box about both the struggles of doing a proposal, but the happiness when you hit the submit button in October. One of the questions that has come up is a little bit of who should get funding or not, because people are nervous about in-kind support if they say their dean is going to work on the project 50% of the time or something. And so Elaine, if someone isn't sure how they should handle that, do you have suggestions of where they could look for more information? Uh, can you restate the question? If you're not sure, you don't, people want to have, someone wants their dean involved, but their dean is saying, I'll just do it as part of my job. They're worried oh. that that could be in kind. And so they want to make sure they handle it properly. All right. You can include um, a person like that as senior personnel on your project. There's no rule against this. Uh, we do not encourage them to be in a principal investigator role necessarily or they could be a co-PI or other senior personnel. Other senior personnel is really a good place for a person like this. You do not want to put them in your budget uh, if, when they're going to do this as part of their normal job. And this is an ex uh, excellent example of when you want to uh, use your facilities, equipment, and other resources form. In that form, you explain the involvement of this administrator what they're gonna do for the project and that they're doing it as part of their job. Um, but we know how important the supportive administration is. And the administrators can help make things happen at that college that faculty might struggle to get done otherwise. Um, they can uh, handle barriers, they can help with communications, they understand the college's relationship with the area industry and will help you, you know, navigate those waters appropriately. Uh, so having your administrators involved is extremely important and it's okay for them to be part of the leadership team. But these proposals and these projects need to be faculty driven. Um, and therefore you don't want them uh, at the top of the page, so to speak. This needs to be led by the faculty with the administrators providing that very, very critical support, backup, encouragement and, uh, and help along the way. Okay, and um, I guess I was gonna ask another example of who might be under the facilities and equipment would be if student services were involved as part of their regular job, but you were going to do recruiting activities? Exactly, that's a very good example. And if in doubt, I'm going to somewhat have the answer to this, but the Mentor Connect Library has information on a lot of these topics if people want more information, doesn't it? 
Exactly, we do. And uh, if you go to the library and um, you just didn't come up with the right keyword to find <laughs> the thing that you're looking for, um, that's why we have a help desk. Um, we have uh, an email address and a phone number and uh, all you have to do is reach out to us and we will connect you with the, uh, with the resources that you need. Okay, and I will say out of the 78 participants, only 59 of you have completed the survey. Do make sure you scroll down and submit it. Um, my students got very tired in evaluations of me going, but I want 100% or I'm not going to be happy. So please um, do the survey. And I don't know if any of you, Elaine, Emery, or Alan, have something you've seen for questions or something you've thought of that you'd like to include as people are finishing up? Uh, there was a question about whether you have to do a bio sketch for an administrator that's not getting money from the grant. If they are in a senior personnel role, the answer is yes. Um, whether or not they're being paid from the grant doesn't is not the controlling factor. It's it's the title that you've given them, either as a, a co-principal investigator or other senior personnel. If they fall in that top section, you know, would fall in that top section of the budget, they're not going to be there because they're not getting paid. But if they would fall in that category, then they're going to have to have a current pending support forms and they're going to have to have a bio sketch. And one of the things that I really learned is if in doubt, ask somebody. Um, <laughs> the Mentor Connect are absolutely wonderful resources. It was mentioned earlier about possibly checking with a program officer. I think that when I was new to NSF, I thought I needed to do it on my own to prove myself. And that isn't necessary. So if you are leaving today thinking, oh my gosh, will I do the form right? That is why there are people like Mentor Connect available to help you. And I think that um, we're getting fairly good with the results and know that we're approaching the time limit. So definitely would answer any more questions, but otherwise we do wanna thank everyone for taking the time. We know it's a very busy time of year and everyone is occupied with a lot of things, but forms are very important and knowing how to submit everything because not having a form that's required could cause your proposal to be returned without review. It won't even be accepted. So ask questions, let me look. And Mike, I think let's go ahead and close the poll. I'll have to be happy with 83% um, for it. So thank you, everyone. Colleagues, that officially ends our webinar today. I'm turning off the recording. Thank you, panelists, for just an excellent presentation today. We'll leave the system open for a few more minutes in case you have a chat question. Thank you.